it is coming up on the 10 o'clock hour on the 20th of January, 2023, here in the city of Cusco, Peru. And I'm here to sort of fill you in as much as I can on um, current events and how things went since um, the last time I posted, which was uh, early evening, late afternoon yesterday. Uh, well, as somewhat predicted, things did escalate substantially in the capital city of Lima, where uh, protesters got much heavier and uh, attempted to reach a number of restricted areas, including uh, very close to Congress that has been restricted for some time. So that's not like a new, they just shut it down and people can't go there. It's been restricted for 20 years. Um, I'm not sure, a long time. And uh, also uh, there, there were more protests in a number of popular tourist areas in uh, Miraflores, which is kind of the wealthiest district of Lima um, and a big tourist spot. It has a large shopping mall called Larco Mar, which is on the cliffs overlooking the ocean. Um, there were a lot of protesters there yesterday and last night and also Parque Kennedy, which is a very popular park, and uh, there's a lot of shopping in the area around there too. Um, so all of these areas were cleared out uh, throughout the course of the night by uh, police with uh, mostly tear gas. Um, there were some injuries reported. Um, I think they were double digits, low double digits of injuries and uh, no deaths. Um, the big news in Lima was that a massive fire broke out at a building near Plaza San Martin, which is another key central Lima location. And uh, it's not known yet exactly what the cause of this fire was. Uh, it is or was a multifamily residence with, I've seen conflicting reports between 14 and 18 um, families living there and it was an old and historic building and it has now fallen down and been completely lost um, and uh, they're still planning on hosing it down with water until noon today so that fires don't break out again it can be very complicated because the type of construction material in use there which is uh, in part uh, there's like lath and plaster inside can um, reignite so they are very concerned with making sure that that stays out. Uh, it was a very large, large um, fire situation. And a lot of people likened it to the first March of the Four Suyos, which uh, took place in 2000 um, as uh, Peru was getting ready to end the dictatorship of Alberto Fujimori, who uh, was the inventor of the autogolpe or self-coup, which is where someone has taken power legally, but then moves illegally to take more power and um, um, become generally uh, a dictator or someone who rules by decree. Um, uh, at, during the events of uh, that original march um, in 2000, uh, there was a large fire at a branch of Banco de la Nación, the National Bank, and um, after that, um, violence sort of ramped up. That's some stuff that is worth sort of Googling and looking up on, but I'm not going to try and give a full history lesson on that right now. Also yesterday afternoon, assaults were made on uh, three airports. Uh, first, Arequipa, which is Peru's second largest city, a city of uh, over two million people. And that got very violent and was very nasty and long and drawn out and took place, including in residential areas. Surrounding the airport, people were completely terrified of what was gonna happen. And uh, ultimately there was one death in that, uh, in that confrontation and uh, police retook the airport and have been holding it secure since then, but it is not operating. So there are no flights in and out of Arequipa at the moment. Um, shortly thereafter, um, further attempts were made to take the airport at Juliaca in Puno, 
Um, also, I understand unsuccessful, but they did shut down traffic at the airport. And in Cusco, there were people on a plane ready to take off and leave. And they had to get down and get off the plane because there were uh, somewhere in the area of 100 uh, vandals that were attempting to shut down the uh, Cusco airport um, and take control of it. And so they managed to shut it down, but not take control. So those three airports are not operating this morning and there is no word as to when operations will resume. So around Cusco, uh, there are people not getting in or out and uh, awaiting news of when those operations will resume. While that large fire was burning in Lima and attempts were being made and firefighters were just arriving to work on putting it out, and while there were simultaneous uh, demonstrations happening in a number of areas around uh, metropolitan Lima and its, uh, and its districts, um, the president and her cabinet issued a pronouncement that was scheduled for 9 p.m. It actually started about 9.20. And uh, a lot of people were thinking that considering the absolute chaos and considering um, how rough stuff looked all over the entire country that she might be coming with her cabinet to announce uh, more willingness to dialogue, more willingness to compromise, or perhaps to step down. Um, that was not the case. Um, instead, her general uh, statement was that everything is under control. Uh, any type of violence or major disruption will not go unpunished and they will allocate the necessary resources to uh, ensure control of um, the public spaces, the uh, uh, transportation routes and that sort of thing. So uh, a lot of people heard that and everything that went with it coming from her ministers in her cabinet as being the opposite of conciliatory and uh, the opposite of um, uh, de-escalation. So there is some concern about what's going to happen throughout the course of the day today. Uh, so this morning, uh, I got out and went to the market and I went out and had a really nice breakfast at a breakfast place I enjoy a lot where I was the only person and uh, <laughs> under normal circumstances there can be a line of 20 to 30 people to get in and get a table at that restaurant and I was the only person. So that says a lot about exactly how little tourist action there is in Cusco right now. And there's a lot of interesting things to be said about that. Um, you know, without a doubt, Cusco requires tourism in order to function. It is a primary driver of economic activity, but it's also a really complicated subject because the question is who makes the money off tourism? And we're going to come back to talking about that in a little bit. <sighs> so, um, other than that, uh, urban transport, so the buses in Cusco, uh, all say, no, they're going to operate as normal today, and they do not plan to have an additional day of strike. Uh, the vendors at the Mercado Huancha, the market near where I live and where I do most of my shopping, say that they expect to be open normally throughout the course of the day. And uh, taxi drivers say that they have not heard of any major action inside the city but that routes in and out are mostly picketed and blockaded. And um, along that lines, along those lines, um, Marta, my BFF and business partner, called me up from Ollantaytambo to, uh, to say that she regretted to inform me that things are still pretty strong in Ollantaytambo as far as the strike. Um, they say, el paro está fuerte, todo sigue fuerte, 
this is what they say in Spanish, um, or we say in Spanish. Um, and she says that uh, the Ronda Campesina, which is the uh, rural militia that is a you know legal and government recognized militia force, and these exist in rural communities all over Peru, and have for decades uh, came down from the rural communities again to the central populated area of Ollantaytambo, and they are um, enforcing that people continue with the full 48 hours of strike action, so it is still a strike today, so they're not letting people take their cars out and drive them around, they're not, um, they're, you know, they're stopping people and saying, you gotta go home, and, um, they're not letting cars in and out, and there are roadblocks, apart from that, all over the Sacred Valley, and at all the major roads to and from Cusco, um, as well as other points, so, um, Fruit trucks from the jungle are not coming up with stuff to bring to market. Uh, so that means we'll see how that goes, what that looks like tomorrow and Sunday, but definitely today they're not getting around. Um, and that was somewhat reflected in what I saw at the market this morning where prices on a number of things, things that are perishable, were substantially low. Um, but like all the chicken, pretty much all the chicken was previously frozen or still frozen, which is considered undesirable here, generally speaking. People don't like to eat stuff that has been frozen. They prefer to eat fresh food. Um, there were some limited uh, supplies in terms, of, uh, in terms of selection and that kind of thing. And I, for instance, had to buy a really large broccoli uh, even though I wanted a small broccoli because I'm the only one here right now and uh, as Marta has pointed out, I'm going to be here probably throughout the weekend because it doesn't look like roads to Ollanta are going to be open. So I will not be going down to the valley to hang out with my family and my cat and all of that kind of stuff. I will be spending my time here at the Cusco apartment, um, you know, watching and waiting and seeing what goes down. Uh, anyway, so so there's all of that. Um, my nephew, Piero, Marta's son, um, went back to Ollanta on Wednesday night. I stayed because I have a medical appointment today, which is a go. Um, and uh, anyway, so he reported that at many points along the route, even before strike action started, uh, the taxi driver in the colectivo that he went in, had to get out and move rocks and clear portions of the roadway. And he went in the late afternoon, early evening when things were supposedly pretty clear. So that is pretty clear because, you know, there wasn't anybody there saying, uh-uh, you can't go through or anything like that. But that, so this is like one of the things here, uh, the route is open means nobody is there making sure that it is shut down, but it doesn't necessarily mean there's nothing in the way. Um, so yeah, generally speaking, that is the deal. Um, as far as, uh, as, as far as uh, other news from Ollantaytambo, uh, one big piece of news is that many people from uh, communities in Ollantaytambo, which is a large district, a very large district in terms of area and in terms of the number of communities. There are 36 communities that are part of the district of Ollantaytambo, which neighbors the, uh, which neighbors Machu Picchu. Um, uh, like it has, you know, a, a border with it, so to speak. Um, it abuts. Anyway, yeah. Um, a lot of train lines were pulled up and removed. Um, and it is unclear based on uh, the reports whether that is only to kilometer 82, which is where the road goes to, or whether it is also below that. So this means that it is uncertain when or how uh, Peru Rail intends to get people who are in Aguas Calientes right now 
out of Aguascalientes. So if you are in Aguascalientes, this might be a great opportunity for you to really enjoy yourself seeing some of the things people don't necessarily get to see. Uh, take a longer stroll through the citadel at Machu Picchu, take a second visit there because, you know, there should be plenty of, uh, there should be plenty of spots open. Um, and they are probably not enforcing the two hour quick route through. Um, there's a really cool orchid garden. There's um, a lot of interesting stuff, like ask people at the hotels you're at what interesting stuff there is to do in the area because there is a lot um, that isn't just going up to the Citadel. Um, and I say all this because you might be there for a little while. Um, there are always questions that people ask about, are there alternative ways to get in and out of Aguas Calientes. And sometimes people say, well, yeah, absolutely. There's the, you go by car route and other kinds of stuff. And here's the thing. You can also hike the Inca Trail in, in and out when it's not closed, which my understanding is that it is um, not really open right now, or that maybe it is, or maybe it isn't, but it's a little vague. Anyway, nobody's gonna guide you out the other way, so far as I'm aware. Then people say, you can also, like, go by car. Well, okay, you're gonna walk a few hours down the train tracks to get to the hydroelectric plant where you may be able to find a colectivo or a bus uh, to take you to Cusco, but remember, all the roads are closed and blockaded, so I wouldn't count on that either. And another thing you can do is you can walk up the train tracks to kilometer 82 and um, maybe be met by buses there that could take you to Ollantaytambo or on to Cusco. But remember, also blockaded right now. And we're talking, uh, we're talking a walk that Inca trail porters generally tell me they consider for themselves seven to eight hours and uh, more like 10 to 12 for most tourists if they're not carrying anything at all, um, maybe less if they are German backpackers. Um, Inca Trail porters have a high opinion of the walking capabilities of most German backpackers. Um, so anyway, yeah, there's that to consider. Um, and it's not, it's not a really hard walk, but it's not a short walk and it's not like strolling along a sidewalk either and there aren't like services along the way so there's not like a rest stop with a bathroom and a restaurant where you're going to be able to like get something nice to eat and stuff like that so those are more extreme options for getting out if you really feel stressed about being stuck in a uh, hotel in a vacation paradise that is desperate to wait on tourists because there are very very few there up to you. Uh, my recommendation would be sit tight, chill out, and you know appreciate um, everything that Aguascalientes and the surrounding region has to offer, which is some stuff. Um, a bunch of people have commented that they are really sad to see destruction of the railroad tracks, and they cannot understand why locals would destroy the railroad tracks. Reports are in that uh, it is not only in the Ollantaytambo district that some tracks have been pulled up and removed, but also uh, along the route that goes from Ollantaytambo into Cusco uh, through Pachar and Huarocondo and along that way. And um, a couple of things to comment, and I'll take the first one first, the short one first, and that is to say for the people who live on the Ollantaytambo to Cusco part of the tracks, they get literally nothing from that train going through there. The train doesn't stop. The train doesn't pick people up. It doesn't drop people off. It doesn't provide local service. It is strictly tourist train when it runs through there. And um, the most that it has engaged with the local population in like Huarocondo, which is on that route, is a couple years ago when it hit and killed a five-year-old boy. Um, so, you know, folks there aren't like, oh no, we get so much money and benefit from the train line coming through. So that's something to know. 
Now, the train station in Ollantaytambo is a major departure point for trains to Machu Picchu, but uh, when people go there direct from Cusco, when the people go to Machu Picchu direct from Cusco via Peru Rail, they generally buy like the bimodal, which is a bus to Ollantaytambo, and then they get on the train, or there is a train from Cusco, well, from Poroi, which is on the outskirts of Cusco, and uh, and they don't stop in Ollantaytambo, and they don't spend any money in Ollantaytambo. So there's that. And, uh, you know, there is a local train that runs down to Aguas Calientes and beyond. Um, well, actually, there's a local train to Aguas Calientes and then a separate local train to Hydroelectric and Santa Teresa down you know, further down river from Machu Picchu. Um, but they're sort of limited hours and kind of limited service. And it's not, um, it's not like it was pre-privatization, which is now some time ago, you know, 25, 30 years ago, um, when there was a national rail company that ran those rail lines. And people have a lot of nostalgic memories of what it was like when you could get on the train and it would stop at all of these different points and it was really useful for local people and so on and so forth. Now, it also had some limitations in terms of maintenance and, and function. Um, and like, I can remember being stuck on the, tra on the train in between two landslides for rather a while. That was, you know, one of those adventures. It was one of the times when my parents said, now remember, Abby, the worst trips make the best stories. And I was like, yeah, ha, ha, ha. That's going to be awesome later. And I was 14 and, you know, it was, I was not impressed with my parents, you know, travel wisdom at the time. In fact, I was kind of pissy about the whole thing. But yeah, anyway, um, <laughs> anyway, so there's that. So there's all of that. So the train doesn't bring money directly into the communities that are along the way, nor does it necessarily provide services. And in fact, uh, Peru Rail has a long history of doing things like hitting someone with a train and then leaving them on the side of the tracks, um, saying that they have schedules to maintain so that tourists aren't inconvenienced and also the guy's bloody and it would be a mess. True story. I have heard this from a number of people who were there and watched the guy get hit by a train and the whole thing. He did eventually live, but they carried him back to the road where he could be transported by car to a hospital. The Peru Rail did not pitch in or anything like that. Um, and then there's also like the time that they stole all the irrigation and potable water in the town of Ollantaytambo and used it to wash trains, but without paying anything to the municipality at all. And nobody had water to irrigate crops and nobody had water in their houses for cooking, drinking, bathing, other essential things like that. And then at that point, like there were big protests and all of that sort of thing. And people were just trying to get Peru Rail to pay for its water use and not take all the water for the entire town. And uh, one friend of mine commented that, um, you know, he was chaining a uh, municipality of Ollantaytambo dump truck to the train tracks um, so that the trains would have to stop at the station and couldn't leave when uh, Peru Rail called in uh, help from the Peruvian government who came in and tear gassed everybody and uh, all of that sort of thing. And so now um, they, uh, they don't have that problem anymore because the indigenous communities of Ollantaytambo rerouted the water infrastructure so that it is harder for Peru Rail to do that. Not because the government said, you can't do that, but because the indigenous communities made it harder to do. Um, so it's a little, it's a little tricky. Uh, also long ago, people used to be able to go in and informally and impromptu vend at train stations and so forth. And now that is completely not allowed. And the only sales that happen on the train are from larger companies that have deals to sell on Peru rail trains and stuff. So 
these are specifically some of the kinds of concessions and things that locals in the south of Peru are protesting and view as corruption, is having sold into privatization the operation of uh, something like the train lines, which now primarily serve the tourist market, which does not bring as much money into it via those vectors as, uh, as people might expect. And so it does not impact local people as much as one might think. Now, Aguas Calientes does get its supplies via the rail line and everything. And so there are some concerns for certain there, for certain there. So it looks like even though it is not officially called as a major strike day here in town, uh, not everybody agrees. So you can see people coming and going from the market and you can see traffic on the street, but we also have uh, these, these couple of groups coming down the street doing some more marching. So uh, again, this is not scary because these folks have been marching for a month or more in Cusco at this point and um, they are peaceful and non-violent but you know here they are they by the way are from areas that are inaccessible due to blockades right now also where my coffee and chocolate comes from. So yeah, as you can hear from what's going on outside and the uh, protest that I just cut away to go show you, um, it's not over. Um, and, uh, there's still plenty happening, um, and there's still plenty of people upset. And again, I want to speak to the perception, uh, which is something that has been put out there, um, by a lot of people in Lima and people in international communities where people are saying, well, who, who's paying for this? Who's paying for all this? Well, that group of people has been here for over a month and they've come from the area that grows uh, coffee and uh, cacao and fruit. And one thing to know is that many of them have family members who live in Cusco, but also they came in trucks and buses and they're sleeping in those, right? They're not like booking hotels. They're sleeping in the trucks and buses they came in. And since those trucks and buses are parked, they're not using fuel right now. And they came with a lot of food and they also have people here who support what they're doing, who are donating food and water and money. And in a matter of a day or two, a very ordinary collection effort can raise 25 to 50,000 soles, which is um, a good chunk of money. Um, minimum wage in Peru is about a thousand soles a month. So that is to say, in one day, a typical collection kind of thing can raise wages, which your living expenses are probably less than that, for 25 to 50 people for a month. All right. So that is some stuff to know. Um, as far as transport, well, who's paying for all this transport? Okay. Indigenous people who are part of the strike own trucks and buses and companies that run transit. And many of them are donating their entire fleet of vehicles to the struggle, as it were, right? And like, that's actually happening. So, you know, like I, I get it. If you're not familiar with collectivist cultures or if you are uh, sort of seeing them from the outside, it is hard to believe because people in the U.S. are never going to pull that off. Like, 
there was a bad storm that took out power where I lived in Ohio for uh, spans of time between five and 20 days. And by day three, people were not cooperative with each other. And I mean, you know, it turned into like total chaos there because nobody can collaborate and because nobody organizes group efforts and all of that kind of stuff. Not how it is here. Those folks, that group of folks that just went by have been here in Cusco for a month doing that every day, multiple times a day. So anyway, that leads me to sort of the wrap up point here, which is how long can this go on? <sighs> yeah, I, we don't know. We don't know. Um, there are diplomatic solutions that are possible. Um, the will and intention has to be there. Um, nobody who's protesting wants this stuff to continue forever, but they also don't want to accept a government that has now killed 54 people and wounded another 800. Um, it, so there are more people dead than there have been days of this government in power. And that keeps going up. They don't want to accept a government that they perceive as uh, likely to make more deals that don't benefit ordinary Peruvian people, but instead benefit the wealthy who are seen as living in cities, including Cusco, or in Lima, especially, um, and um, that they don't get anything from. And then at the flip side of that is that you have people who are generally better off who are saying, this is ridiculous. You can't tell me that things haven't improved a whole lot for the average person in Peru since neoliberalism and privatization and a lot of this kind of stuff uh, came on the scene. And there's definitely an argument to be made that that is the case, you know. Uh, there's definitely an argument to be made that there absolutely are more roads and bridges and, uh, you know, better airports and more schools and better uh, hospitals and a lot of that kind of stuff. Absolutely true. And there absolutely are also indigenous people who previously didn't have access to you know, a lot of the modern world, let's say, who now do. So there are people who I grew up with who, you know, when we were five years old, um, it was early or in the middle of the agrarian reform processes that began in the 1960s. And those were people who had never owned a pair of shoes and their family had nobody in it who uh, had ever gone to like actual school school. Um, and now they own buildings and have amassed, have begun to amass generational wealth and their kids are lawyers and psychologists and doctors and a lot of that kind of stuff. And so yes, that is arguably something that came about um, in part because of privatization and greater wealth and investment in Peru. And it's also something that arguably came about because of the agrarian reform, which took land rights away from the hacendados, the colonial owners who had had that land forever and returned it to indigenous people and uh, rural communities and restructured all of that kind of stuff and began under military rule as it happens to uh, to build that infrastructure like elementary schools and public health clinics and that kind of thing. So I would say that the state of improvement for the average person in the south of Peru especially is due to both of those things. Number one, you've got people who have the right to own land now and have for 50, 60 years owned land in their family. And before that, they did not have the right to be anything but serfs essentially, right? So that's pretty big. And that is something that those people have been able to leverage through commerce and free enterprise and neoliberal privatization to do things like go to college and become lawyers and psychologists. So there needs to be some kind of a balance. 
because a lot of those things that I mentioned that have improved people's lives that, you know, you would be hard pressed to argue they have not improved people's lives like better roads are also things that have been corrupt projects and are examples of what everyone talks about as corruption in Peru, where a contract was made to a foreign company to work on roads and they embezzled a ton of those public funds. And that is stuff, those are scandals that have been going on in Peru over the past 10, 20 years, right, as well. So there's a lot here and it is very complicated. So uh, for people who look at it from the perspective of, what are you talking about? You know, you've got a nice house and you own a car and 25, 30 years ago, you and your family didn't do that. Like that looks like, that looks like these are people who are being ungrateful for progress. Whereas for people who have struggled to find ways to uh, capitalize on the fact that they now can begin to amass multi-generational wealth for the first time since the conquest of Peru. Um, you know, things like seeing public funds be embezzled by foreign companies with contracts to build bridges in Peru uh, and the Congress people who let that happen, making money off those deals too, is unacceptable. And it is still the case that people in a lot of rural communities do not have anything more than a field that they can grow ultimately potatoes and corn and quinoa. And so, you know, those people still feel the pinch those people still feel the pinch. And questions come up like, you know, well, hey, so now people can go to private clinics and get like great healthcare for affordable prices. And that's true. Um, but a lot of the really less well off people can only go to the public health clinics that, uh, that attend them on the um, insurance plans that are available for the very poor and what's available there can really vary. So, like I say, there are a lot of ways to look at this. It is very complicated. And because it's so complicated, I don't see like an immediate solution to like everything that people are asking for, right, in the protests. But what there kind of needs to be is something that looks like it is going in that direction as opposed to something that looks like it is going in the other direction which is sort of what people here think it looks like right now. So what I'm hearing in the streets today around Cusco is a lot of confusion and frustration and uncertainty about what people think is the best thing to happen. Like people don't want to just rush elections and have the same crappy candidates that have not been able to get anything done and have been up against, you know, deadlocked Congress that opposes them and all of that sort of thing. They don't want to see the same Congress that has an 88% disapproval rating stay there doing the same stuff that it's been doing that they don't approve of. Uh, they don't want to see um, more of this chaos. They do want to see constitutional reform that should address some of these things that people are really unhappy about. And it is really a mistake to characterize the people who are marching as uneducated and unclear on what it is they're marching about. If anything, people in the city who don't see what those day-to-day -day lives are like um, and who don't talk to those people and who you know don't speak Quechua, for example, so they can't have those conversations with a lot of that population, um, find it easy to dismiss those concerns. And, uh, and so it is, it is really tricky. It is really, really tricky. And um, so I would say what we're seeing is the culmination of uh, many, many years of frustrations and concern. So right now people are saying, well, so what? What do we do? Do we go back to more of the status quo? Do we, do we let contracts that are coming up for renewal just be renewed for 30, 40, 50 years and consign ourselves and our children and grandchildren and people who haven't even been born yet to more of the same? Is more of the same good enough? Is it going to get worse? Is more of the same automatically trending towards, uh, you know, further kinds of disenfranchisement of the have-nots? Um, 
what's the deal? What's the situation? And so there's a lot of discussion happening right now. And it's about the short term, it's about the midterm, and it's about the long term in terms of what people hope for. And uh, I would say it's really complicated. And I, I couldn't tell you, like, uh, I couldn't tell you exactly what I hope will happen or anything like that. Like, even if that were, um, even if that were entirely appropriate, it's not the entire goal of me engaging in this type of commentary and reporting. Um, so, yeah, anyway, um, now I gotta get my butt in gear and get ready to uh, go past that same group of protesters and go down to my medical appointment and uh, uh, see you later on today. Um, stay tuned.